Hello, and welcome to the Today Show. I'm your host, Christopher Power, with Kojiko, your TV Halton, the Disability Channel. Our guest today is a award winning author, a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in history, and the youngest to be a producer at BBC. Most recently, you may recognize his work of The Mysteries of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes. Stay tuned for Anthony Summers. Anthony, welcome. Thank you for your time and being with us on our show today. It's good to be with you. So, Anthony, we're going to dive into it here. You've written about Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, John F. Kennedy, J. Edgar Hoover, Richard Nixon, Admiral Hudson Kimmel, Frank Sinatra, and now Marilyn Monroe for a second time, if I understand. Looking back at all of these people, who was the most interesting for you to write about? Oh, they're all so different done over such a long period that your first question is going to be one of the hard ones to answer. Um, I, the easy answer is, is, is Marilyn Monroe, but that's probably not so. The last big book that I would with my, my wife and co-author, Robin Swan, was about Pearl Harbor, the attack, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and Admiral Kimmel, who was the admiral in charge of Pearl Harbor when it was attacked and was blamed for the rest of his life, was demoted and basically scapegoated. Um, maybe it's because it was my last book, but it, uh, that was a fascinating study in psyches, um, the psychology of that man and the way in which he was bullied by the government and eventually more uh, reclaimed his his reputation was fascinating to me but so absolutely was Marilyn Monroe <laughs> most of the writing that you've done has turned into types of documentaries when you start out writing is that your intention to share it on multiple media platforms or just literally not exactly, because as I hope you can tell from the number of my books that you referred to just then, I've been doing this for a hell of a long time. My first book was in 1976, and there were no different media platforms then. Um, I first became conscious of it as media platforms, I suppose. I suppose when I was doing my book about Richard Nixon, um, um, Yes, or, or possibly Frank Sinatra, um, which was after that, and which may be the next book that is studied for by Netflix for, for television purposes. Um, I so I I didn't plan on that on the, the different media platforms because at the time barely any different platforms existed. But now you can't do anything without thinking about media platforms. So you just have to go with the flow. Fair enough. Now, you've, you've done a lot of work on all of these known figures of the world. And I mean, when we talk about Charles Manson, he's really not a stranger, but you had the opportunity to interview one of the Manson family members. When you were doing this interview, were you scared at all? No, I don't think scared is the right word. It was a strange experience. Uh, I was in Los Angeles um, right after... Um, the Manson family had struck and k killed those people. And um, funnily enough, I went to see them at the top of Topanga Canyon, um, where they had what that was known as the Spawn Ranch, where Manson had, had groomed his, his uh, young women and, and pe people in, in, a, in a, a ranch used for making movies. Right. making cowboy movies um and that was where i had lived years early that was where i had lived years earlier uh, when i was writing the marilyn monroe book so i knew the place and i believe it was, was when we were talking to squeaky from one of the girls who later went on to take a pot shot at the president of the united states she missed um happily um, 
but she told me a gruesome story too too gruesome and too raunchy to to talk about on, on television yes, of yes. how they had killed one of the um cowpokes at this movie ranch uh in the middle of, basically in the middle of a sex act and that was certainly very spooky um Jeez. But by that time, I had lived through quite a lot of war coverage in, in Vietnam and later um, worked a, a good deal in the Middle East. So to say that I was scared compared to some fears that you naturally have in a war situation, no, the little girl didn't scare me. <laughs> and I, I like how you put it, the little girl didn't scare me. That's That's awesome. I want to talk to you about Norma right. Jean. The little girl that is my granddaughter. She, they scare me. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Your granddaughters are more terrifying. <laughs> That's awesome. I want to talk to you about Norma Jean Baker, Marilyn Monroe. How did she come across, across the name Marilyn Monroe? How did I come across the name or how did she come across the name? How did Norma Jean Baker decide on the name Marilyn Monroe? Oh. Well, she was happy at the beginning to, as a would-be actress, um, having had no experience really beyond um, appearing in pin-up magazines, things like Laugh, L-A-F-F -F magazine, um, filled with, which typically was filled with picture, glamour pictures, which in those years in the 40s were not sexy at all, at least not, not sexy the way we think of it now. Right. But were pictures of people bathing beauties in rather respectable bathing costumes by modern standards. And she'd been in, in these glamour pics and was wanting, trying to, to, to break into Hollywood. And um, she, her name, Norma Jean Baker, didn't go well down well with any agent or, or, or would, would be film person. Um, and she finally got the beginnings of her break into movies with 20th Century Fox. And um, she she was working um, with an agent. She wanted to be called, and I, and I wrote it down today. It's a name that a completely disappearing name um, that didn't improve. Um, she she um, wanted to, she, that somebody suggested that she be called Carol Lind, L-I-N-D which Carol was Lynn. a rather obvious composite of an, an opera singer and a dead actress. And that didn't go down very well. Um, and she was sitting on the beach, beach house home at the beach house home of um, the, the man from the studio she was dealing with, Ben, um, who, who was famous for, for a radio um, series called, called um, Life with the Lions. Um, and and um, he said that he, I know, you're Marilyn. Oh. And Marilyn went down quite well, but she said that she wanted to be called Monroe for her second name, not because it rang well, mm -hmm. but because her grandmother had been called Monroe in, uh, oh. it, before she was married. And, and, and so Ben Lyon said, that's great, Marilyn Monroe, we'll stick with it. And... By God, she's tagged with it. And we, we, we all, only, most people only know her as that. That You're absolutely right. And not a lot of people know that story. I really appreciate you sharing that. I mean, when most people hear Norma Jean Baker or Marilyn Monroe, they think of a, a woman who sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President, the illustrious movie star. Do you know how Marilyn was discovered? Well, it grew really out of that first stage with with Ben Lyon. Um, there's a, an, another quote that, that I, I pulled out because I, I thought you'd be asking me about this. And Ben Lyon, the man who gave her the name, said he, he recalled later that, quote, she had a good face. You can tell with some faces the way the flesh sits on the bones, the, the planes and the angles that they'll photograph well. In addition, there was the way she moved. That was 
but but that was so it was nothing to do with her acting um it was it was that the way she photographed or would photograph and the way she moved and didn't an awful lot of people come to come to think that as well that's such a, a unique insight to it that it's more how the the flesh hangs and how you're going to be photographed as opposed to the skill or the ability of acting and it seemed to be more of a of an eye catcher which is yes kind of there's a less way. there's a less smart way to put it of course which is that she for, for people taking photographs mm -hmm. still photographs i mean or she was or for film as it turned out she was a general a genuine natural she was just a natural for the screen at a time when the screen in itself was still a, a, a developing process, very much a developing process in the mix. She was a gift to cinema. Well, a gift to cinema. I like that. We're going to take a, a quick break and we'll be right back. All about inclusion and really giving everyone a fair say. Welcome to the Today Show. This is our flagship show. I am Unstoppable Tracy. I am Zach Damon. It is a pleasure to be here. I am excited. What is up? We have a great show today. Jay Stoyan here for the Disability Channel, the world's only inclusive channel for and by persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, everyone. We have people watching from all over the world, but also all over Ontario. We also take a concerted attention in the veterans community. In moments of stress and trauma, we can get a hold of ourselves. To help make a difference for people with disabilities, to show people how to love themselves or their disability. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me, giving this platform for myself and other people with disabilities. Thank you so much, folks, for joining us for this episode of the Disability Channel of Detroit. Please tune in next time. Welcome back to the Today Show. Our guest today is Anthony Slummers, award-winning author, and we're talking about Marilyn Monroe and Norma Jean Baker. Now, Anthony, in 1985, you published a book, Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe, and now you have a release, The Mystery of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes. What are the major differences between the two bodies of work? Well, you're referring to the, the title of my book, well, Goddess. Um, and and the name of the Netflix film that I'm told 15 to 20 million people have watched in, in the last um, couple of months. Um, it's been an extraordinary success. Uh, and um, net, the Netflix people came to me and and said they wanted to do a, a film about Monroe based on on an arising from my work mm -hmm. and in the course of casual talking over cups of coffee and stuff a bit stronger um, it emerged that um, I had in, in a storeroom upstairs the audio tapes of most of the interviews that I conducted for the Monroe book back in uh, in, in the 80s in the early 80s and Netflix were amazed and astounded and delighted. I had kept those interviews um, because at the time, largely for legal reasons. What, why does one record an interview? Well, I record them to make sure that, that the, any quotes I use are absolutely accurate. You also needed to make sure that they were absolutely accurate right. um, in case the lawyer said, um, and know about this in case the lawyer did he or she really say that well compared to scrappy notes in a notebook having an audio tape w was I ideal 
and I had kept these interviews uh, initially fr from the Munro book, 650 of them, wow. initially in a leaky old shed on, on my property here. Uh, and eventually, um, because I was advised that they were valuable, as they turned out to be in the end, eventually in a, in a proper storeroom. And they mercifully existed for the Netflix people and they exist today for anybody who wants to go and listen to them at the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Sciences. Now, I've donated them to the Academy of Motion Picture Sciences mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. So during your investigations and, and speaking with 650 uh, people there, you had found flawed evidence, inconsistent statements, and a conflicting timeline, which fuels further speculation that the silver screen icon was murdered. Is there something specific that stands out to you from your investigation? Let me be clear. Do you mean from my investigation of her life or, or the investigative circumstances of her death? I would say the circumstances surrounding her death. Ah. Well, the, what kicked off for me, what kicked off the project was that I, well, I was not going to do a book at all. I was in a major British newspaper um, to go to Los Angeles because the district attorney in Los Angeles was had reopened the investigation into how she had died and the various mysteries that everyone's about one way or the other mm. about how she died and, and what what were the inconveniences in, in the accounts of her death and, and of course the major point did she probably commit suicide the verdict of the district attorney's office and, and at the time um the coroner um at the time or that question that people asked so loosely, or was she murdered? Um, and so I was asked to go and do a newspaper piece. And I got there and did five or six interviews. And I realized I was drawn in and I sent a mm -hmm. cable to London, cables in those days, saying, um, I don't really want to do this article at all. I'd rather either drop it altogether or, or do a book. And the um, the, the newspaper in London mercifully said, "Well, no, you don't have to pay us your pay us the the flight to Los Angeles back. Stay there, do your book, and we want first option on the on the rights." So um, I set set about work, working on the book. I was just drawn into it by the fact that there were so many seemingly unanswered questions, and especially important for me, there were a number of people who hadn't given interviews back when she died in 1962, 20 years-ish earlier, um, but seemed to me ready to talk now because they themselves were getting a little bit older. And, and the beauty of that now is that I interviewed people, most of whom, not all, but most of whom have since themselves died. Oh. So the interviews that, that I conducted become a, a, an all sort of sort of treasure and in the end with my then wife and, and child I I, I um, rented a rented a little house uh, up in Topanga Canyon um, down the coast a little way from um, Santa Maria and worked very very hard for I think about 18 months to two years and then for another year uh, in in Europe on 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 the project and and it worked out from, weren't mercifully for me. Wow. I think it's so, I think it's because all all, all the books that I've done uh, have been thorough because I don't think for me there's no other way to 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 face yourself if you put something down in in print in, in a book. You have right. to be able to look over your shoulder and say, I did that as right as I could. Nothing's perfect, but you get it as right as you possibly could. And I think particularly now that I've been able to finesse some things in the, the last six months for the new edition of the book, which is still called Goddess, like it was in, in the first place. Hmm. Um, I think 
for, for history's sake, um, it's, it's as correct as it could be. Okay. I, I don't mean to brag about that. No. I just think it's in, important to, in this case where so much twaddle has been written about Marilyn Monroe and especially about the end of her life and 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 her affairs with the, or alleged affairs with the Kennedy brothers and so on. Um, it it really was important to to try and drive drive some truth through all the gossip. No, that's fair. So when we that when we... that elusive thing called truth. <laughs> When we when we talk about the truth, I'm just wondering if I can get your opinion on a, on a controversial statement that she actually made once saying that, you know, she longed to put on a black wig, pick up her father in a bar, make love to him and then ask, you know, how do you feel now that you've had a daughter that you've made love to? With your intimate knowledge of, of Marilyn and the limelight she was in, what do you, it, was there something underlining there? Was she trying to secretly say something? Was it as literal as she meant it to be? Well, she said that privately um, to a wealthy businessman called Rosenfeld, um, Henry Rosenfeld, um, whom she knew in New York City. Mm. He remembered vividly, wouldn't you remember vividly being told that by, by Marilyn Monroe, with whom he himself had had an affair, and he was himself an older man. Um, and she was talking about father. It was a statement she made she made such statements she made them humorously and she made them seriously um who can tell when it's just out of an anecdote but i do believe that she said it and it's clear that she was very mixed up about her paternity about who her father had been um she didn't grow up most of the time with her mother her mother was disturbed woman who spent Marilyn's life in um, what we were used to be allowed to take asylum. Um, mm -hmm. And um, who was religiously obsessed. Um, Marilyn, as she was growing up, would talk about who her daddy had been. And her mother, at one point, would point to a photograph on the wall of a man with a little moustache who looked like Clark and through mm. Marilyn's growing up, Clark Gable became a sort of romantic father figure. And of course, in the end, she acted alongside Clark Gable. Um, so she was in a real muddle about, and remained in a muddle about older men and about her real father. She did research into who her father had been and there were, a, a, a couple of principal candidates. I believe from talking to one of the candidates' relatives that she did go at one point um, and try to talk to the guy who may have been her father, a fellow called Gifford, um, and that he was didn't turn her away, but it came came to nothing. He didn't welcome her. Um, so this was a big upset for her. What she meant by saying that she'd like to sleep with her father and then reveal that he, he just to him that he just slept with his daughter. God knows what was going on in her mind, but <clears throat> she talked like that. She in private, she would talk, talk the hind, hind legs off a off donkey and you, you couldn't quite know ever what was serious and what wasn't. She was an emotional model. Um, and of course, her last few years, and and before that, a great deal of time was spent with with psychiatrists. Her state of mind is very much related to virtually everything, and certainly in the last ten years of her life, from the late twenties to through her thirties. And I could, if you like, I I, I was able to get hold of. Um, some of her last psychiatrist notes, and I could, if you'd like, read, read to you from them. Yes, please. If you do, that would be amazing. Um, the, he, he was Dr. Um, Greenson was his name, and he looked after her for the last 
two or three years of her life. She had a psychiatrist on the East Coast in New York, and she had, um, and she turned to Dr. Greenson on the West Coast. He was a famous Freudian psychiatrist, and um, he reported what she was telling him to the East Coast psychiatrist, so that the two of them could liaise with each other. Right. And he died by the time I got into the book, but his widow allowed me to see the letters and so on that he'd sent to the East Coast psychiatrist, which now, ironically, um, are all locked up and won't be opened in, in, in the library that holds them for many years. So we do, in that sense, have an exclusive to, to the notes. That's he awesome. noticed at once that she seemed, when she first went to see him towards the end of her life, heavily sedated. She was slurring her words, a poor reaction. She seemed remote, seemed unable to understand conversational conversation and rambled on incoherently. She wanted to go straight onto the couch for Freudian therapy, which um, she knew all about. She'd read up about, she'd read about everything and she'd read about that. But Dr. Greenson, who was alarmed by the state of her, decided instead on supportive therapy rather than deep psychoanalysis. And he started looking into her every day. But what he did was completely un atypical of Freudian psychology, right. um, psychiatry. He invited her into his family because he thought what she seemed to lack above all was real human content and friendship and the sort of thing that you and I mercifully, hopefully have in, in our lives all, all the time, that ordinary people have in their lives all the time. And by that time, the famous Marilyn Monroe was in truth a very lonely figure. What he came to believe at the end was that he noted, and here's the, the technical speak, medical speak, symptoms of paranoia and depressive reaction to signs of schizophrenia. Oh. He knew above all that he was dealing with a psyche so fragile that it could crumble into crisis at any time, which is very much what happened in, in her final years. Wow. We have he, to he did a... notice something else which would 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 and this is a, a, again an interesting quote in terms of how we all think of Marilyn Monroe, the, the extraordinary glamour puss. Mm -hmm. That he reported, the psychiatrist report, reported that rather pathetically, this sec, sexually dissatisfied woman gloried and reveled in her personal appearance, feeling that she was genuinely an extremely beautiful woman, perhaps the most beautiful woman in the world. Well, one can't think of anything more likely to mess a man or woman up, and especially a, a, a woman in thinking that they're, quote, the most beautiful woman in the world, which of course is a, a human being that doesn't exist. Jeez, that's, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. We're going to take a, a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Dave Stevens with the Disability Channel. An inability to break out. I'm sitting by the door on the second floor. Losing my seven year war. It's not an illusion, so why the exclusion? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It's about you. So. Joining me and uh, welcome to this beautiful Travelers Championship. I only want one accolade from you. So my story is unique. It's amazing. But it's not anything that you guys don't have inside of you. I'm not a hero. I'm not anybody special. I'm just this guy without legs and went out, and I just did it. Stats are way the Democrats, the diplomats, and the bureaucrats. This is probably your first interview down on the ground on your butt and stuff like that? First time ever, baby. All right. 
Stay with us and the Disability Channel. Welcome back to the Today Show. With us is award-winning author Anthony Summers talking about Norma Jean Baker, Marilyn Monroe. When we talk about the, the Freudian theory and the, the most beautiful person in the world, uh, just before we went to break there, how do you, in your personal opinion, how do you feel that really plays on somebody emotionally and mentally? I think the core of the problem was that there was Marilyn Monroe. There was the person that by that time she'd presented to the world for years and been presented as by by the nonsense that the studios pumped out and by the illusion of cinema. Mm -hmm. And hidden behind the, the, the real poor real person who was in a weird way homeless and a lot of the time had no love and was the complete contrary of what people imagined her to be. Um, that's that's my last lasting image of her. And I think very much the true image of the woman that died in August 1962. So I would like to ask you a little bit of a, of a personal question. We, we touched on a little bit of that she overdosed and then it's been ruled kind of towards a suicide. Do you believe that it was self-inflicted suicide? Do you think that, you know, the, the Hollywood got to her and that the world around her was in such a state that that was kind of her answer for herself? I, I, I'm not God and I wasn't in the bedroom um, in, in which Marilyn Monroe died her pathetic death at the end. Um, but I, as, as a journalist and somebody who for the last two or three months has been answering uh, the hundreds and hundreds of letters that I've had from, from viewers of the Netflix film and from read, readers of my book, um, I've always tried to answer all letters unless I I can see it instantly that they're they're from nutcases. Sure. <laughs> I don't reply to the nutcases, but I try to reply to to everybody who who's reasonably sensible and takes the trouble to write a little letter. Um, what was the state of her when she when she was late late in her life? Well, Dr. Greenson, the psychiatrist we've been talking about, said before he died, I should have played it safe and put her in, in a sanitarium, but that would have only been safe for me and deadly for her. Remember that Marilyn's mother was in a sanitarium or what I rudely called a lunatic asylum. Marilyn was afraid of, not surprisingly, of the idea of mental instability. And it was much simpler than that. This was a woman who had no real life. Mm -hmm. She, at 36, in, in her last year alive, she acquired very first owned property, even though she'd had so much money down the years. She'd lived in, in apartments, um, and so do millions of other people. But you'd have thought that somebody with the money she'd been paid might have owned her uh, and owned her own property by that time. She moved into her own property. She had been having, and here we get back to reality and unreality again. She'd been having, I was going to say affairs. You might just mean she'd been having something that purported to be an affair with President John F. Kennedy, which was more of a swift passing thing in the night as which was typical of, of President Kennedy throughout his life. 
a very unsatisfactory brief thing, which had ended. And now she was involved with Robert Kennedy, um, who's the Attorney General. Why had she become involved with Robert Kennedy? I don't know, um, because I wasn't there, but I'm satisfied that the, the liaison existed because I've talked to people who knew both of them and who, who realized this was going on. Did Bobby Kennedy get involved with her because he was asked to, 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 to get her away from, from the president? I, again, I don't know that but it, it would be a tough thing to happen was Bobby Kennedy a very married man with I think about 10 children at that point um, would he have with, with with Marilyn Monroe some people doubt that but you know I talked to the historian Arthur Schlesinger um, who was the great Kennedy historian right. um, and, and he sat with him in New York at, at lunch and he said look Bobby Kennedy, yes, he was a very married man. He wasn't anything like the, 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 the womanizer that his, his brother, President Kennedy, was. But he was a man, and he was on the road all the time. And when the bedroom door opens, of when Marilyn Monroe's bedroom door opens, wouldn't most men in those days have walked through it? And... I think he put it well. You just can't count it. You can't say because he was a married man, there was no affair with Bobby Kennedy. Sure. There was something with both brothers, but it was something that she most of the time could only deal with at a huge distance. She was a sort of super above reality figure called Marilyn Monroe, dealing with sort of having affairs with people, two men who themselves were in some sort of stratosphere of ordinary life. It was all unreal, and it was all unreal, and um, it eventually she, she died feeling loved, feeling let down. The psychiatrist, she, she told him that she'd go to have, have the evening the last day of her life with one of the important men in her life which was a mm. fairly transparent reference to the Kennedys and she didn't have it and it was in the end just a case I think of a woman a forlorn woman in a state of misery that a lot of ordinary people experience every day of the week We're going to take a quick break, Anthony, and we'll be right back. Okay. Are you currently on ODSP? If you're interested in social media marketing, TV production, podcasting, or getting off assistance, please contact Jay Stoyan at 647-339-6847. Or J at the Disability Channel .ca, the Disability Channel, showcasing abilities. Welcome back to the Today Show. Our guest is Anthony Summers. I have a question for you. Some people believe that around her suicide and that we can draw parallels between the Kennedys, her untimely death and a comment that was made. And I'm just wondering your opinion on it, where it says the truth would come at a terrible cost to government agencies. Are you able to speak to this comment? I don't think anything that's said about her now would come at a terrible cost to government agencies now in 2022 at the time it, it would all have been embarrassing i think but and and um would, would call, the truth about what happened at the end of it would caused consternation 
perhaps you mentioned government agencies, perhaps in the FBI. Why? Because the FBI um, at the end um, confiscated her phone records. I'm quite sure of that I talked to the man who ran her local telephone company back in those days. Much more importantly, I talked to a very senior former uh, FBI agent who'd never spoken to anyone before, who said that he was one of the people who removed Marilyn Monroe's um, phone records fr from the record at the telephone company headquarters. Literally, on, on during the night in which she died, and during the 24 hours afterwards, as it were, cleaned up. That was a secure matter at the FBI at the time, obviously. But who asked the FBI to do anything? The senior FBI agent that I interviewed on this subject said there were only two people who could have ordered that, the removal of the phone records. One of them was, was the Attorney General, um, Robert Kennedy, and the other one was the President himself, probably through Robert Kennedy. So the, um, the problem at the time was, and in the sense of family secrets still is, um, compromise for the president and for the attorney general. I, I think that we probably have come as close now and we're only going to, ever going to come to what actually happened, partly because most people connected with the case have died. Right. There may be some, some uh, documents in the FBI, I suppose, that would tell us more about it. Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, I've also written a book about him, and as you know, he, he kept documentation on everything, especially on things that could impress people that he regarded as his enemies. So it would be typical of Hoover to have stashed something in a way that would, and in, in the course of time, tell us more about Marilyn Monroe's end. Probably information that, if truthful, would, would compromise the Kennedy brothers. I see. Where can people learn more about you and your upcoming projects? Uh, the upcoming project, I'm afraid, is, is <laughs> one can say very likely top secret. No, no, I'm, I'm just not Fair going enough. to talk about what we're currently working on. Uh, they can look at um, our website um, under under Anthony Summers, and 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 inform themselves on what we do and how we do it. Um, what what I can talk about it is is our methodology. As I've said, what we try to do is to drill into any subject we tackle, just as far as we possibly can. It's it's easier in a sense today to do that because of the internet and the internet by contrast and contradiction also makes it harder because there's so much rubbish on the internet so much garbage on the internet um but i think we still work just as hard as as we ever did and we are i say we because of my wife and co-author robin swan we are both equally um rightly or wrongly, obsessed with getting it as right as possible. But I do think that with this Monroe book, we have, and certainly in the latest edition of, of Otis, um, as close to the truth about her life and the, quote, always called mysterious death, uh, as, as, where, as anyone is ever going to. Yeah. I, I do have one last question for you, Anthony. What makes Anthony Summer smile? <laughs> well, you just made me smile. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, I, I think my grandchildren, of whom I have a bunch, um, make me smile most. Um, they, 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 especially when they, they tell me things that I want to hear. I'm just as much of a fool as uh, of a grandfather as, as any storybook grandfather. And and um, what I also like, because well, I've got one or two of them that are starting to be, or think they're growing up, 
um, is when they're silly enough to look through my books, look at the pictures, and in some cases, actually read bits of the story. That that makes me smile and makes me proud. Beautiful. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you for tuning into the Today Show. I'm your host, Christopher Power. Our guest today is the amazing investigative journalist, Anthony Summers. Ensure you check him out at anthonysummers.com. You can also get a copy of his new book, The Mysteries of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes, and Goddess. Don't forget to head over to the disabilitychannel.ca, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and remember to have a fantastic day and smile to inspire. Thank you.